So welcome everybody. Uh, this is the American Anthropological Association's webinar series and our webinar today is the measles outbreak applying anthropological understanding to vaccine hesitancy. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's uh, wonderful to have such an outpouring of participants, especially on this very timely and important topic. So we're excited to have everybody here today. Um, my name is Kristen Hedges. I am the co-chair of the Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies. And Dion Claiborne is also one of the participants logged on today who is my co-chair. Hi. <laughs> so Anne, could you scroll, uh, move to the next slide? I was just gonna give a quick overview of our uh, group and then give an overview of the talk today. So the Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies, we are a special interest group of the Society for Medical Anthropology. The purpose of our group is we are, were founded with the idea to network among members in order to be able to rapidly respond to developing public health issues and emergencies. We officially were formed as a special interest group in April 2017. Since then, we have kept our footprint very light. We try to keep it mobile, and so we interact mostly over a Facebook group. The uh, link to join the group is right there. You can also just look for the ARHI, the Anthropological Responses to Health Emergencies on Facebook and join the group and a lot of people are able to interact on that group. So far we've had a lot of interactions over Zika and Ebola and now also with the measles. We've also been working on developing an expertise database. This is a short Google form that it only takes five minutes to fill out and the idea with this is we want to have a database of experts who have some knowledge and background on different health issues. That way when an emergency arises, we already have a pool of people we could turn to. So that's some information about our group and we are the hosts along with the American Anthropological Association today. And next slide, please. So the overview, the outline of today's talk is we have, there we go. Our outline today, we've got four different speakers broken up into about 15 minutes each. We are going to start with Leslie Rodriguez. She is from the CDC and she's gonna give an overview of the current measles outbreak. Then we'll move on to Lisa Soba from San Diego State University, who's gonna talk about her research um, in the title is Vaccine Selectivity or Herd Immunity for Sheep. Next, we'll move on to Karen Sutasik and she's at the University of Minnesota looking at belief in science and where we're at today. And then we'll finish with Shelly Lees, who is in England. She's with the Aved Project and talking about vaccination during medical emergencies. We are trying to leave a good chunk of time, about 20 minutes for question and answers at the end. Throughout the webinar, if you have questions on the bottom, you'll see a chat room. Feel free to post your questions there. I'm gonna be collating all the questions together to help moderate our question and answer session. And we wanna make sure that we've got all questions answered. We also are gonna have the ability to have an ongoing communities platform that I'll give the link to at the end so we can continue having conversations with each other. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Leslie to get us started on looking at the current outbreak. Great, thank you. Can, I, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Um, thank you for inviting me today. We're excited to be here and to talk to you about what is going on with measles here at, uh, what we've been hearing about measles here at CDC. Um, I work in our National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, and I work in communications here, and I've been leading the communication aspect of our response to measles at CDC. Uh, next slide, please. So for my presentation, I'm going to give you kind of an overview of where we stand with measles now. Um, as well as give you some information about what we know from about vaccine hesitancy in general, as well as vaccine hesitancy in the Orthodox Jewish communities in New York City and New York State. Uh, I have spent time there and we've been doing a lot of uh, talking to different stakeholders in those communities to kind of figure out what's going on in ways that we can help and, and be able to hopefully stop some of these uh, measles cases from happening. I also talked to you a little bit about how we communicate with parents about vaccines and then some of the next steps that CDC has in dealing with this outbreak. Next slide, please. All right, next. So just to give you um, some of our numbers here, from January 1st to May 24th, we had about 940 people from 25 states with measles reported here to CDC. 
uh, and that's the greatest number of cases in the U.S. since 1994 and since measles was declared eliminated in 2000. We will have um, an updated case count probably come out very soon because it pro will probably be surpassing the 1994 numbers here very soon, and so we will be having some press around that as well. Uh, we've seen measles outbreaks, and a measles outbreak is defined as three or more linked cases, uh, and they have been going on in across the U.S. in many places. In New York, since 2018, since last year, I mean 2018, sorry, um, and it's Rockland County and New York City are the most affected there. We've also seen California, Michigan, Georgia, Maryland, many other places affected. Uh, I think I have the next slide, please, has the um, map showing some of the cases where we've seen those reported measles cases. You can see it's, uh, it's getting a lot of traction all over the country with this being such a very contagious disease. We are seeing it spread very quickly into pockets where people are not vaccinated. We see it start with an importation from another country and then spreading into these communities where we're seeing under vaccination. And the way that we, start, we talk about stopping these outbreaks is one, public health infrastructure, so local public health uh, has to track, trace all these cases, do contact tracing, figure out where these folks have been, seeing who hasn't been, who doesn't have protection in these communities, and then vaccination and making sure that everyone is vaccinated so that we can stop the spread. Uh, so those are really the ways that we are trying to, in most cases, deal with outbreak situations. However, when we see a situation where they have some hesitancy with the vaccine, then we have to try other ways to make sure that we get people to learn more about the vaccine, to learn about the importance of vaccinating, to understand the complications involved with measles. We've seen that that has not been something that um, people in a lot of these communities don't feel like measles is very serious. And I'll get into some of that when I go into some of the things that we learned in the community. So next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of what we're doing right now at CDC, we have an incident management structure within our center to um, really put resources towards measles where we have lots of people working on this topic full time. We're also investing in state and local health departments, um, helping build some of the capacity there in their public health infrastructure. We're providing assistance on the ground with the outbreak investigations. We are sending people there to help with the contact tracing. It's it's very difficult in a situation like this in a local health department when you have an outbreak of this size because you usually are not staffed in a way that allows you to really go through all of your cases and track each case and look at all the contacts. So we have been helping with sending people and assistance with that. Next slide, please. On the communication side, we have been um, working to provide technical assistance with public health officials. We developed a measles outbreak toolkit that we have used and circulated with healthcare professionals in those groups, in the groups that are being impacted, um, as well as for their local public health. We have a measles outbreak toolkit for them as well. We're doing a lot of uh, community stakeholder type of outreach, so rabbinical groups, camp groups, medical associations, but the chapters that are in those different places are really who we're talking to. Uh, and we are trying to do all of this because it's really important for the members of those communities to have clear, consistent, and credible information that they're getting through their trusted sources, not coming from specifically CDC, but just through trusted sources of information. Uh, we also have on um, the lab side, we're doing a lot of work there for diagnosing cases and um, looking at the, the virus genotypes and strains as well. Next slide. So now just to get into a little bit of the vaccine hesitancy, I mean, vaccine hesitancy in, in the U.S. is not a new phenomenon. This is something that has been going on for a long time, and we see it kind of shift and change directions in different times. There's a lot of attention on it many times, and there's less attention on vaccine hesitancy other times. Um, and so we've seen it kind of go all over the place, and this is just the next realm of it that we're dealing with um, vaccine hesitancy now. And just to give you an idea that we, we know that it's hesitancy happens because immunization is very complex. It's a very complex communication environment for parents to navigate because parents see that they don't see anything happen. So when prevention works, nothing happens. Their child doesn't get sick. 
um, and that there are so many different places where people can find information and not really understanding what the best sources of information may be. There are many websites and publications and things that look very credible and trustworthy that are not. Uh, and so it's really different difficult for people to decipher what is the accurate information and what is not. And we know that there are different groups of parents that may have different interests and needs. It's, all, it's difficult to make sure that everybody is getting their question answered. And some parents may just have a question, some may have concerns, but just because they have a question or concern doesn't mean they're not going to vaccinate or that they're vaccine hesitant. It's that we have to address the question or concern. If parents are interested in their child's health and they want to make sure that all their questions are answered before they proceed with vaccinating. Now we know that uh, healthcare professionals are parents' most trusted source of information, but their time with them is really limited. So they're going in to see a pediatrician and often they don't have a lot of time to ask all of the questions that they have about their child's health or about vaccines or about vaccine preventable diseases. And often we hear that information around vaccines is dynamic and changing and that people hear different stories and different ideas from different parents. And so it's, it's very difficult to make sure that we have messages that address every single misconception that's out there. We are also in um, New York, we have some further complications because parents are getting preyed upon with misinformation. So just to give you an idea here of, you know, a few years ago, we saw a lot of vaccine hesitancy had to do with MMR vaccine. Um, Jenny McCarthy was very, was coming out talking about how she believed that the MMR vaccine caused her son to have autism. Um, and this, you know, was around 2008. We saw a lot of this happening. And we, with Wakefield as well, there was a lot of talk about making vaccines natural, the green our vaccines movement, um, Dr. Sears with the alternative vaccine schedule. So we saw a lot of this type of hesitancy that was surfacing at that time. And we talked a lot to vaccine hesitant parents. Uh, we had a lot of qualitative and quantitative research that we did at that point, as well as with healthcare providers. And with the healthcare providers, it's very similar some of the things that we are hearing now from them where they say, well, we're so overwhelmed. We're trying to talk about this topic all the time with our parents, but they're not listening to us and they're not, they're listening to other sources of information. And they're, I, we are, they're, we're supposed to be the ones who are caring for their children, but that's not what they're letting us do. And so there's a lot of frustration, I think, on the healthcare provider's part of trying to do the, the right thing by vaccinating the children, but that they feel like the parents are really having a hard time with trusting them for that. Next slide, please. And when we had a big uh, measles outbreak as a result of a Disney um, exposure uh, many years, several years ago, we saw kind of some shifting in the vaccine landscape where there was less, less talk about anti-vaccine and more people talking about coming out very pro-vaccine and saying, you know, shooting down anything on social and digital media where somebody would come forward and say that they didn't believe in something around vaccines. And then we would see all of this information where people just would jump into these conversations. People we didn't know, people we weren't even aware of where they would correct all of the misinformation that they saw online. And it was really, it's been interesting to see kind of some of those tides turn. Um, and recently there has been, we heard that on Reddit, that there is a way that they're quarantining, uh, they have a kind of way that they're isolating information that is vaccine misinformation that is being put on their website. And I thought that was another really interesting move where they're saying, you know, if you're looking for vaccine information, you click on whatever this link is, and they have identified that as being vaccine misinformation. They're saying this website is quarantined, and instead go to CDC's website, and they have a link there. And so I think that there is some shifting on the social and digital media channels to address some of the um, vaccine misinformation that's out there. But um, I'll go into some of what's happening in New York, and that's much more of a local uh, outreach that needs to happen in those communities. It's not as much on the digital space. Next slide, please. All right. So in um, New York, when we were there, we heard that there was a it's like a little booklet that has been circulated throughout a lot of these communities, um, and they call it the Peach Handbook, and it is supposed to be parents educating and advocating for children's health. But um, the actual handbook contains a lot of vaccine misinformation, and there's a lot of this information that it got directly mailed into the hands of a lot of families in these communities, 
and the families read it and believed this to all be credible, accurate information. And then this led to some questioning of some vaccines. Um, so it was interesting to hear that. This was a few years ago that this went out. And now kind of with this measles outbreak, we're seeing some of what the effects of this have been. Next slide, please. So in talking there with a lot of um, the individuals in those communities, we know that many of the kids initially got immunized when we saw some of these outbreaks happening. The healthcare provider said, you know, we saw tons and tons of kids coming in, tons of families coming in, making sure their kids were vaccinated. But now we have these final holdouts who were the ones who were not vaccinating, which are taking up a lot of the time and energy of a lot of these healthcare professionals trying to have these conversations with them. Um, and the discussion and the education are taking a lot longer than in the past. And the physicians are starting to feel really burned out about it. And some of the physician practices have even stopped taking unvaccinated patients because they're worried about exposure to the kids in the um, waiting room and anywhere in the office. We still know that most of these healthcare professionals in these communities are the most trusted sources of information for these parents. And um, we know that parents may be delaying vaccines, especially when a child is ill, but they may just be delaying vaccines in general because they feel like they're getting too many or they're trying to still make the decision. Um, so it, there's, that is definitely something that we've been talking about, that the delay is something that we have to make sure we're addressing as well, not just the refusal. Uh, there's a local health center there. We talked to many federally qualified, we talked to a few federally qualified health centers and several uh, pediatricians and you know, many of them have taken this on, this topic of measles. They said, you know, we didn't know this was going to be something that was going to become such a big issue in our community, but it has. And now we're trying to do everything we can to address it. And this Rafua Health Center there has taken a really impressive, um, comprehensive approach to attack the measles issue from all angles. And they've really worked to empower all their staff to talk about vaccines. They've made it part of their culture and their, and their practice that everybody talks about it from the front office to the nurse, to the uh, pediatrician, everybody across the, uh, the care continuum will talk about it. And they have also educated their staff on how to talk to parents about vaccines, and they are pulling their provider's vaccination rates and sharing them across the practice to say, such and such provider has this level of MMR vaccine, and you know, you're not up to that level. What, we, what can we do to make sure we get your vaccination levels up higher? And being able to show that between providers so that they can kind of learn best practices from each other. Next slide. Um, and what we learned from some of the parents that we talked to is that we saw that some of the parents in these communities may, a lot of the families were large, they have a large family, and some of the moms may have chosen to vaccinate their older children, but then maybe at some point got this misinformation or started thinking it wasn't they weren't, they didn't want to vaccinate anymore. And so their younger children may not be vaccinated. Um, and many of the parents had some very kind of vague or general worries about vaccinating, but there weren't a lot of very specific things that you could tie to saying this, I don't want to vaccinate because of X, Y, Z. So there wasn't, you know, the autism thing did come up, but it wasn't something that came up all the time. There was just general sentiment of worry of vaccinating and what, what that would, ha what would happen if you vaccinated. Um, so, and we all also heard from pediatricians in the area that they feel like the outbreak is larger than what we are even seeing because there's underreporting happening. There are families who ch whose children may ha get measles and that they are not reporting that the children have measles and then we haven't even counted those in our case counts. We also heard kind of anecdotally that there are, there may be teachers who are advising girls in high schools against vaccinating. Um, and some moms may be delaying MMR or may get MMR, but many may refuse other vaccines. So then the public health there is really thinking about the long-term implications involved there if, you know, this measles may be the issue now, but if there are other vaccines that are being delayed or refused, what is gonna be the next thing that we see in these communities? Next slide, please. So just to give you some idea of how we are communicating with parents about this topic, we know that when people are upset, they may have difficulty processing information. So we have to simplify information as much as possible. People may focus on the negative, so we have to keep the language more positive. People want to reinforce their current belief. Uh, so it's, you know, we ha we're having to change minds from people who are already kind of set in the way that they're thinking about things. And there tends to be some distrust. Um, and in these communities, we do see that there's distrust of government, of public health, 
And so we're trying to make sure that, like I said before, making sure that the information gets through through the right stakeholders. Next slide. And we know that how people perceive risk is also different when um, we have situations like this, that there's a lot of emotion involved. Uh, people may not think of the risk of measles as being that serious, and so the characteristics of this risk may not be enough to really push them to get vaccinated. They may rely on biases and other factors, so something like the confirmation bias where someone will just, they will, they will select the information that is confirms what they already believe, um, and that's what they will listen to. And so there are other things that are in play when people are thinking about how their, their, their actual reality, their perception is their reality. Next. So we use a lot of the risk communication approach here when we're doing um, our work in these types of situations. So that's the science of communicating in high concern, high stress, emotionally charged, or controversial situations. And we use this because we want to strengthen our credibility and improve the communication with these audiences. Next slide. So just to give you some ideas of um, examples of ways that we do this, where we want we show empathy in a lot of our messaging and materials. I mean, the main thing is here is that we know that parents want to protect their children. I mean, that's the main topic, and that we try to make sure that we frame it in a way that we're acknowledging that you are gathering information, you're trying to learn as much as you can about these topics because you want to protect your children. We understand that, and we have information that we want to help share with you um, because you need to hear this side of the issue as well. We try to make sure we're acknowledging both the benefits and the risks of vaccines. We do talk about the side effects of vaccines that, you know, any potential risks that there may be, but also the benefits and making sure that parents are aware of that, you know, in most cases, those benefits are going to outweigh the risks of the vaccine. And the CDC being CDC, we do a lot of citing data and facts whenever possible. And we know that on the other side, people who are more opposed to vaccines, often they use um, stories and more personal accounts. And that speaks to some parents. And we that's not an approach that CDC usually uses. CDC is more science-based and we share a lot of our data. But we do know that on the other side of the issue are those uh, groups that are sharing the personal stories that really appeal to some of these individuals, especially in these emotionally charged situations. We try to make sure we talk about what we know, what we don't know, um, and what we're trying to do to fill the gaps that we see out there because we do, there is information that we don't know in any outbreak situation, any situation, and we want to be clear that we don't have all the answers. And we try to give concrete action steps because people want to know what they can do to protect their children. Next slide. And just wanted to give you a few, an idea of some of the next steps we're taking here. Um, so we, like I mentioned, we're sending personnel or we've sent some personnel to Rockland County for technical assistance. They're helping with the case investigations. They're helping with implementing um, an incident management structure there at, in the county. We're also working to build consensus among local stakeholders. So we had a um, letter that went out to a lot of the rabbi groups and rabbinical associations that's a consensus building letter where everybody signed on to say they were all supportive of vaccine education and making sure that individuals in these communities were uh, got credible information about vaccines and that they were going to help us get that information out. We're also developing new resources. We, ha we keep hearing information that maybe is not quite clear to our audiences or that they may need more information about. And so we have been developing new resources in different formats to help with that. We're also going to provide support for those local grassroots efforts that are um, targeted at educating those communities about vaccines and measles. This is more of a long-term strategy, so it's more building capacity at the local level to educate their community about this, this topic. And it's not just measles, like I said, that there's implications if, if we just use MMR right now, we talk about MMR, we have to educate about the importance of vaccinating, the importance of protecting kids all around so that we are keeping kids on schedule and we don't see another outbreak of something else in a couple of years. And we're also working to stop the importation of measles. I mean, that's how a lot of, like I said, this is how a lot of them start. So we're trying to work at that level to stop the disease from coming in. And that's all I had for my slides. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Leslie. Just as a reminder, if you have questions, and I am writing down the questions that came in while Leslie was speaking, we're gonna go through each of our speakers and then have a question and answer session at the end. So just keep posting your questions in the chat room. Next up, we have Elisa Soba, and I'm gonna pass it over to her. Okay, here I am. Um, this is very strange doing a webinar because I can't see the people who I'm talking to, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. So my, my little portion is called vaccine selectivity. And there are just um, two points, no, there are three points I wanna make before I get into it. Um, the first, of course, being thank you to Kristen and Dion and um, everybody at the American Anthropological Association for making this possible. Uh, well done. Secondly, I, I know that uh, in, in the sort of main discourse around this, we, we tend to talk about vaccine hesitancy, but I prefer for now, and because there are a lot of anthropologists out there, I'll continue to use selectivity. And I like that word um, for what I'm gonna talk about because it, there's a sense of agency in there that I think with hesitancy, we don't always think about, that people do select, choose to, um, give certain vaccines and to not give others. So selectivity is the word that I'm gonna stick with. Although I can be flexible depending upon which group I'm talking with. And I just wanna quickly just mention the sheep. Sheep, uh, the image was given to me by participants in my research, but sheep are social animals, humans are social animals. Um, and you'll see where I'm going with this as I get going. Oh, I have, I have to realize Anne's gonna click the slides over. So if you would do that, that would be great. Right, so um, I, I wanna start with a slide that could have been at the end, sort of stating what is obvious to culture theorists, um, but something that we often forget in day-to-day -day life, that when we focus on a binary opposition and we talk about it as if it's true, it can sort of become true in the way that we act on things. And the oppositional framing of the vaccine, well, I'll use the word debate, it's become really self-reinforcing. Um, the, the us versus them way of thinking is really a false binary that masks what on this slide I've just termed the muddle in the middle. And um, Leslie spoke to the complex communication environment when you're talking about vaccination in a clinical setting. I think I'll just additionally point out um, that there are a lot of people in the middle, even people who would, would self-proclaim as a vaccinator, because again, with this binary, you're either a vaccinator or you're not. Even some people who would self-proclaim to be a vaccinator have sometimes skipped some vaccines. I'm thinking of a friend right now who would definitely consider herself a vaccinator, but then it comes out that when her kids were um, before the age of one, there's a particular vaccine that she skipped. So it's a little more complicated than just you either vaccinate or you don't. Um, just to, again, uh, most people whose children are not fully vaccinated have actually given their children some vaccinations. So that idea that you're a full refuser, there's very few full out non-vaccinated children. I'm focusing on pediatric uh, vaccination in this portion of the webinar. Um, when parents have more than one child, we just wanna keep in mind that the calculus for each child can be different. It's also gonna differ by disease. It's gonna differ by vaccine formulation. Um, it's just it's really complicated. So another problem with the oppositional framing is that it can lead to a stigmatization of one side or the other. And that stigmatization itself can solidify your identification with a particular vaccine stance, either being for or against. Next slide, please. Again, I guess just to hammer the point home, uh, when you have an us versus them way of talking about something, sometimes this leads to a cornering of people who are gonna commit themselves to a position. And once a position is taken, it can be pretty hard for a person to untake that position. Um, there's something called cultural cognition, Dan Kahan and his group, and that emphasizes the cost in terms of uh, loss of your social network and loss of your, your in-group if you, if you decide that you're gonna adopt a position that they don't uphold. There's also some interesting research in behavioral economics that I think really could inform this question in the future. And this would be looking at how can we apply theories such as sunk costs or what's termed the endowment effect or um, a, a concept whose name I really like, divestiture aversion. The idea that this is my identity and I've, well, sunk costs into it. It cost me a lot to give that identity up. So I got really interested in, well, what do people get from identifying with a certain position? And, and maybe again, here's with the sheep. Uh, not only when you 
when you decide to dig your heels in and hold on to your identity, you get to retain that sense of self that you've built up over time, but you get to keep your friends, right? You get to remain part of your flock. You get to remain part of your social network. And that social aspect of the whole vaccinating question is very important and something that we cannot lose sight of. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some research studies that brought me into thinking about this. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, but there is, I just want to uh, mention, I had put into the set of slides some references if you really want to get into the weeds of what these studies were about. So uh, next slide, please. Right. I, um, I didn't want to study vaccination. It wasn't my intent at all to ask questions about immunization and so forth. What happened to me was I, I'm a, a medical anthropologist interested, we'll just say pediatric health, child health. And I, I got interested in the idea that schools are sites in which health is produced or, or the opposite, right? Ill health and so forth due to school lunches and lack of recess and all that. So I was doing some research um, about 2012 on this idea of, of uh, health producing schools. And one of the sites was a Waldorf school. Waldorf schools are what we might call alternative schools. They're independent private schools and they favor experiential learning. Um, they do not have any standardized testing and that kind of thing. So this is just a picture of a kindergarten that I got off the web, um, you know, Creative Commons. It's not the school that I was at, but most Waldorf schools have this kind of look. Uh, so, okay, that's the setting. And I was studying um, the pedagogy, which within the Waldorf education community is considered health promoting. And I was very interested in that, talking to teachers, talking to staff. And as part of this study, I also began to speak to parents, some focus groups and some interviews. And just to ask the parents, well, what do they do at home to reinforce the health that is produced? By okay. One of the things that caught my ear but that I really didn't want to pay attention to was in a focus group. Sometimes people would say, well, we do this, we do that but also our children are so healthy because we don't vaccinate here. Okay. What triggered something in me uh, to think about this more deeply, well, the we is important, but also there was some friction there. There was some tension there. And um, there, I didn't want to poke the bear though, and it didn't really tie into what the focus of that project was, so I ignored it. And I ignored it, next slide please, until I really couldn't ignore it because being an anthropologist, you kind of have to pay attention to what people in your studies are, are focused on. And so after I finished up with the, the, the pedagogical production of health, I said, you know what, I really have to look at this. So the we was a sign to me that something very social was going on here. And I started to think about this and uh, I started a, a new project where we started to say, okay, what is going on here? And it turned out, you know, we expect to hear it's 2012. What are the kinds of things that people are talking about when they talk about not vaccinating their children? And all the stuff, um, all the, the reasons that came up that we have all heard in the news, these parents were pretty specific, perhaps more specific than Leslie's group. They knew exactly what would happen. The ones who, who, who didn't vaccinate or who were selective in vaccinating. But what struck me was how dedicated all of the parents were not really educating not. themselves regarding their children's health. This was not a deficit-based form of action or inaction. These were people who were acting out of knowledge that they had collected and decisions that they were making based on self-education. Next slide, please. Right. So, I have to think about this. What's going on here? So, I looked at some numbers and I tried to kind of piece together what was going on. Did the school just attract people who already weren't going to vaccinate their children? And it turned out, no, that was not the case at all. Sure, some people came with the children that didn't have all the vaccinations, but it turned out that when you look at the numbers, the longer the family stayed, the less they vaccinated their children. There were some notable fall-offs in vaccine amongst the younger siblings of the, the older child or the index child. And as we look at the vaccine exemption rates and this these were these were data collected prior to the change in law in California in 2017 the rate in kindergarten was 51 percent the rate in seventh grade was 72 percent so this tendency to be selective about va vaccination tended to grow and increase in families after they had become embedded in this community I have in the square brackets the point that only two of these children in kindergarten were fully unvaccinated. And again, I want to 
not forget that, that full out non-vaccination is actually a, a kind of a rare thing. Next slide, please. In looking at these numbers and in looking at the qualitative data, what people told me about their relationship to the school, their relationship to vaccination and so forth, I put together a, a conceptual model of this, a propagation model. And, and basically it goes like this. And again, once you start to think about that, you go, oh, yeah, of course. In your, a small relationship intense, independent school, it's going to be the perfect incubator to foster a certain kind of thought that catches on in this community and kind of takes hold. It's like a Petri dish and the ideas are taking hold. And it makes sense that it would take hold in, in, in an independent school where the people who come to the school already emphasize their independence. They're making a choice to go to a school that's all about active learning, that's all about critical thinking, and that is about refusing the state curriculum. This is a school that doesn't do standardized testing. It doesn't do mainstream education. And so, of course, it kind of starts thinking, of course, these kind of ideas are going to catch on because there's already a good cognitive matrix to catch those kinds of ideas. The rejection of the mainstream is further intensified by the fact that once, once a family gets into the community, they're making more and more friends within the community and their social ties are inward port pointing into that community. So on the slide, I have one of these social network diagrams and each triangle, these are your friends. This is your flock. This is going to be a major portion of your social network. And so now we start to see, okay, again, going back to this idea of cultural cognition, thinking about the things that your community thinks helps you to be part of it, helps you to show people that you're part of it. Not everyone, but for some families, that was part of the medium that helped to cultivate or foster uh, a stronger belief that you should be selective about your vaccinations. Next slide. What is this slide? Why did I put this slide in here? I put this slide in here because um, Waldorf communities are now being singled out in the media, and they had been actually previously, and that was part of the reason why I was hesitant to even think about the vaccine problem, because I already knew that there, that was a very fraught issue for the communities. Um, uh, also, the Hasidic Jewish community is being singled out. But I want to make a caveat about the Waldorf School first, and then talk about can we compare these two different kinds of communities. Um, this kind of thinking is common across the board in these libertarian, independent, <laughs> alternative and even homeschool communities. One of the reasons that Waldorf is sort of held up as, as the model for this kind of thing is that when you go down the roster, the list of school names in any community and you look at the um, rates, the vaccine uh, exemption rates or non-vaccination rates, the school's title often has Waldorf in the title. So there's the Waldorf school of here, there's this and that Waldorf school and that Waldorf school. So it looks like they're the ones that are doing it. But I want to point out that there's many smaller independent schools in which you find the same kind of vaccine selectivity. So there's that to think about. They're not the only ones. And then there's also something to think about, well, how do we, how, is this a, 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 an apples to apples comparison between say the, the different religious communities and these different alternative school communities? Mm, yes and no. There's a lot of layers to vaccine selectivity. And some communities have, um, a complicated history with institutionalized racism and bigotry that's different to the kind of uh, stereotype of Waldorf community as only privileged and you know first world problem kind of thing. So for example um, in the Hasidic Jewish community there's this whole legacy of torture under the guise of medicine and governments that don't always protect us. So these are just layers of the issue that I think it's worth thinking about as you try and figure out in the local community that you're investigating or working with what's going on there you have to be locally relevant. Next slide. Thank you. So going back to the idea of this um, community emphasis on independent thinking is a very American emphasis, isn't it? I mean, America is, is a place of independence, but the school itself is, is even more intensely in favor of that. But it's not the school that promotes vaccine selectivity. And that's a really important point. It's maybe in the community, 
but it's not the school. There's no official promotion of this from the Waldorf education people. In the study, nobody talked about the school as being a place they came to because they tolerated or embraced non-vaccination. That is not at all why people chose the school. And in fact, on this slide, I put a point just so that I remember to speak to it in the focus group, there was even a complaint that the school didn't proactively inform parents that there was the waiver option that existed at the time. So there's this kind of overt culture of vaccine selectivity, but at the same time, going back to the focus group, when people said, we, this is our identity, there was squirming. There were some parents that had to sit on their hands. And in fact, in one situation, I was kind of afraid the fur was going to fly because somebody did speak out. But for the most part, in these small, inward-looking communities, if there's a norm about vaccine refusal or vaccine selectivity, that can keep the vaccinators quiet. They're, they don't want to overtly talk about something that's going to go fly in the face of group norms. Why? Because that's their community. And again, you don't want to lose your friends. You don't want to lose your social network. They may even think that they are outliers because of this, we don't vaccinate. But in fact, most, if you, look, if you look at most of the children, very few are fully unvaccinated. And so it's a question of kind of like the silent majority. And the silence enables that self fulfill the stereotype becomes self-fulfilling because people believe it. And so, next slide, please. Lisa, just to give you a heads up, we got about five more minutes. Got it. Thank you. I'm just going to emphasize again that that silence enables stereotype self-fulfillment, that the brown sheep are there, even though they were behind the text. So how do we, what do we do to change the narrative? What do we do so that that stereotype doesn't become the image of who we are and so we become it? We have to not feel it. We have to publicize the actual facts. And again, I know I've said it before, but very few students have no vaccinations. Most students actually have many vaccinations. And if that comes out and people say, oh, okay, maybe the we don't vaccinate isn't actually true. So that's an important factor about those particular schools or any alternative school setting where that gets entrenched. Another thing that came out of the study is we don't want to put those dug in parents on the defensive. When you start to mandate, you have unintended consequences because people just dig in further. A third point, unless you also spoke to this, is that you have to praise parents' engagement in their children's health care. That's something they're doing because that's what we do in America. That's what we've been told to do. Next slide, please. Those selective vaccinators are, in fact, model parents. They're model patients. This is just an, an ad for take charge of your health care. It's the kind of thing that we as parents or as patients are bombarded with. You're supposed to be self-responsible. You're supposed to take charge of your child's health. And so parents getting out there and trying to self-educate, they're just doing what they're told to do. Next slide, please. Here's just another one of those advertisements from a kidney talk show, as a matter of fact. That requirement that we be self-responsible is out there, and the parents are really simply just fulfilling it. And, you know, they have knowledge of prior government or expert failure to protect us from things like asbestos, from things like thalidomide, DDT. And so in this American consumer culture, it makes sense. They're doing what they're told to do. So you, we really don't want to slap people down for that. Next slide, please. Sometimes people will say, yeah, well, they're out there, but they're looking at the internet and the internet is full of garbage. And that is absolutely true. The internet is full of garbage. But I want to make a point from a, a follow-on study, which went out into the larger community and collected data in regard to people's um, information literacy. And it turned out that the partial or selective vaccinators were actually more information literate than the full or up-to-date vaccinators. Following on from this, and we go to the next slide, it turned out that the selective vaccinators also had more knowledge, correct, and I put it in quotes on the slide because this is the official knowledge that's put out by CDC and put out by experts, so the real quote, correct knowledge. The selective vaccinators were more knowledgeable about how certain things like, for example, herd immunity works than were the fully vaccinating parents. 
So the score is 69% had, correct, had high correct knowledge compared to 46%. So that's a really important thing to think about is that people who are selectively vaccinating actually are, are more educated about vaccination than people who are not. And this is something that they realize as well. I'm gonna just skip to the bottom of the slide and I'm just gonna show you, here are some of the things that full vaccinators in this broader community study said. They didn't really say much. They didn't have much to say when it came to explaining why they vaccinated. I just went with a package. It's part of the program. Somebody even said it seems like a cultural norm. So, so the point of this slide is that the real sheep, and this is a perception given to me by selective vaccinators, mind you, but the real sheep are the people who just go to the doctor and just vaccinate their kids without really asking what's, how does this work, without really knowing how this works in the child's body, just going along because it's routine. Interestingly, full vaccinators in this second study, who, as I said, they really didn't have much to say, they didn't say, very few people said that they would vaccinate for the social good. That social good was not the motivating factor. It was just routine. So there's where the subtitle for this set of slides come. Herd immunity is her sheep. Next slide. Right, so why do I have an apple pie on here? Um, because in United States, we're the land of the free and people have a choice. And we have um, made patients, made parents responsible for their child's health in a way that's really pretty intense. And because people have accepted that responsibility, we have to acknowledge that and we have to go with that. This is nothing that's gonna go away. This is the American way. And so this is the culture in which we have to work. So we have to work with it. Next slide, please. Key lesson is you don't wanna, and I think that also Leslie went over much of this, so I, I won't say much, but don't dismiss the parent's interest in saying more, uh, sorry, in knowing more. Parents want to know more, and we have to address that. We have to provide the information, and we have to speak in relative detail to their concerns, because not doing so is just patronizing. Don't oversimplify, that's insulting to the parent who has taken the time to learn about vaccination. If you give a parent a choice, which is what we do, you cannot slap them down for taking it and you cannot punish them for doing what they're told to do. Next slide. Um, just quickly, we talked about, Leslie talked a little bit about uh, risk, risk education. This is a different angle on it. Something that parents need to know in a supportive context is to put that risk of an allergic reaction from a vaccination, which is one in a million, into context. And here are just some statistics that you can look at later if you like. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. The main message from the studies that I have undertaken and that is corroborated in all the research that's coming in is that if we wanna have a conversation, we have to give up that oppositional thinking. We have to stop with the polarizing rhetoric and we have to look for the common cause. The common cause is keeping our children safe. And if you wanna have a conversation across that chasm, we have to collaborate in that way. Putting people on the defensive just reinforces the division and that is not gonna help the situation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Elisa. And next up, we have Karen Sue. I'll pass it on over to you. Thank you. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to Kristen Dion, the AAA, and also to the other uh, presenters. This has been incredibly interesting so far. Um, and I'll just launch in to say that my entry into this conversation had to do with the narrative of believing in science that emerged during the 2016 election and which surrounds the discussion of vaccine hesitancy or vaccine selectivity. Um, and um, I focus, as an anthropologist of science, I focus on the trope of belief because it really hit me hard when I started to see it so visibly um, and so loudly um, discussed in the aftermath of the election. Um, 
partly because it is such a curious notion, the idea of belief in science is such a curious notion when deployed in scientific context. Science, after all, is, meant to be, is not meant to be a domain of belief, but it's supposed to be a domain of proof. Yet, as debates over issues such as vaccines and climate have become more intense in recent years, advocates for science repeatedly and increasingly invoke the importance of believing in science. So for example, um, in her acceptance speech at the 2016 Democratic Convention, Hillary Clinton explicitly made a link between belief in science, stating, I believe in science. And can we go to the next slide and play that clip? I think you have to hit it twice to play. Uh oh, can people not hear it? Um, and I think you have to have the sound on. And do you have your sound on? Give us one second. Okay. believe in science. <laughs> I believe climate change is real and that we can save our planet while creating millions of good paying clean energy jobs. Okay, so um also, in the aftermath of the election, protesters adopted the statement, um, and if you can go to the next slide, um, putting it on signs at various post-election marches and on t-shirts, you can buy it online still. And if you go to the next slide, you can see you can even get an I Believe in Science t-shirt for your kid or a onesie for your infant. So, um, the adoption of such claims worked not only to illustrate a contrast between Clinton and Trump, between liberal and conservative, but also to draw a sharp, con a sharp contrast between those who see science as granting privileged access to the truth and those who are perceived as misguided. And so this becomes a popular um, presentation of um, people who challenge vaccines or who um, challenge the science of climate change. But from an anthropological perspective, these claims really present a quandary about how to engage critically with scientific evidence and other social facts without reifying scientific truth as some form of unquestionable authority to which only accredited scientists have access. In their introduction to an edited collection of essays in American Anthropologist on the theme of what happened to social facts in the era of Trump, the anthropologists Karen Ho and Jillian Kavanaugh make the point that it is crucial to contextualize and analyze how hierarchy, authority, and various interests shape and fracture shared knowledge. I want to make the point today that the discourse of I believe in science too easily reinforces the arrogance and dismissiveness of expert authority that have fed the diverse popular resentments that have led to our current political moment. And I also want us to think more expansively about how such resentments are produced and mobilized. Critical scholars of socially situated knowledge are centrally concerned with how science is both situated and works to naturalize power. There is nothing self-evident about facts. Nonetheless, to avoid having our work appropriated by denialists in approaching science and scientific knowledge anthropologically, we need to find a way to articulate such analyses in a manner that neither unquestioningly defers to scientific authority nor dismisses its legitimacy as a source of useful and important knowledge. And I think this picks up on the point that 
Elise Sobo just ended with of you know being respectful and having conversations. Um, in Trumpism, we find both a disrespect for evidence, for example, in Russian interference in the election and in climate change, and a disregard for truth, for example, in inauguration crowd size and in the efficacy of vaccines. And um, this disrespect for evidence and disregard for truth come together in a willingness to accept alternative facts. In response, claims about belief in science circulating and mixing with a range of social concerns during and especially in the aftermath of the election have been popularly mobilized as resistance to Trumpism. In statements such as science is real, facts matter, science doesn't care about your opinions, and so on. These kinds of claims rely on identifying facts and truth with science, but do so without addressing the question of why when it comes to issues such as evolution, climate change, and the efficacy and safety of vaccines, so many US citizens remain resolutely unconvinced by scientific knowledge. Anthropologists have long worked to illuminate how people everywhere seek to grasp the world, both metaphorically and literally. Such efforts involve thinking deeply about the natural world, seeking to make sense of the mess of the universe into which we are born, and also how people everywhere work to shape and control that mess. The two key and often overlapping cultural domains work most explicitly toward these efforts, the realm of religious or spiritual life on the one hand, and the realm of expert knowledge on the other. Historically, both spiritual life and the development and use of expert knowledge were widely understood by anthropologists as deeply social except when it came to knowledge practices associated with science and biomedicine. But since at, le at least the early 1980s, anthropologists have recognized that all knowledge practices, including those associated with biomedicine and scientific research, must be understood as thoroughly social. And this work illustrates the deeply social practice of developing scientific facts. And in so doing, shows how the social can never be separated from scientific knowledge. So claims about belief or faith in science now work in the public domain as resistance to Trumpism because of Trump's comments about climate change and vaccination. And again, I want to note the irony that claims about belief in science are being used to contrast faith in science with other beliefs or faiths. So science is not supposed to be about belief. It is supposed to be about making knowledge claims convincing. For example, the claim that I find the scientific evidence regarding climate change convincing is different from I believe in climate change or even I believe in the science of climate change. The former, I find the scientific evidence regarding climate change convincing, like scientific facts themselves, is contingent. The latter, I believe in climate change or I believe in the science of climate change, are absolute. They're statements of faith that are akin to widespread understandings of the basis for religious commitments. Now this is not to say that those who articulate belief in science have not been convinced to do so by compelling evidence. Many certainly recognize that scientific knowledge is continually emerging, often overturning previously accepted facts. But however we define science, it is the only area of the academy in which we are supported <coughs> to believe. No one asks us to believe in English or believe in art history or believe in anthropology. Um, so it's ironic that the very disciplines that are supposed to be the most rigorously rooted in evidence are the ones we are exhor exhorted to accept on faith. So what are the effects of this? Unlike the nuanced perspective that is being presented here, um, today, um, claims about believing in science are too often mobilized to characterize those who doubt the science of climate change, the efficacy and safety of vaccines, or the theory of evolution as right-wing religious yahoos or out-of-touch hippies who just simply do not believe in science, rejecting it out of faith in something else, a particular strain of conservative Christianity or new age ideas about immunity and health, for example. Such characterizations misrecognize both the nature of religion 
faith and belief on the one hand, and the complexity and diversity of those who resist or challenge scientific knowledge on the other. Approaching these issues anthropologically really requires contextualization, and that's why I really appreciate the work that's being presented today. Um, anthropologists have long recognized, for example, that religion characterized by faith and belief is not the inversion of thought, argument, or evidence that is so powerfully assumed in the public representation of those who question the science of climate change or the efficacy or safety of vaccines. At the same time, as Elisa Sobo's nuanced ethnographic analysis of a community with a high rate of anti-vaccine attitudes demonstrates, those who question the efficacy of vaccination cannot easily be categorized or misinformed, but may be, as she showed in her presentation today, highly educated and dedicated to self-education regarding child health. In her analysis, Sobo contextualizes and analyzes how community, hierarchy, authority, and various interests shape how parents think and make decisions about vaccinating their children. When it comes to the measles outbreak, it's important to recognize that there is a difference between suspicion of science that grows organically out of personal experience or an established belief system and social media fueled conspiracy theories. For, insta for instance, when it comes to a Christian scientist, vaccine refusal could be of a piece with a larger orientation to health and medicine. That said, the Christian scientist church acknowledges the importance of wider community obligations regarding health and states that their practice is not dogmatic, that church members are free to make their own choices regarding vaccination. In response to the measles outbreak in the Hasidic community in New York, a number of Hasidic rabbis, and this has already been discussed, um, have stated that there is no Jewish doctrine forbidding vaccination. Nevertheless, as Leslie Rodriguez pointed out, a glossy booklet spreading anti-vaccine messages titled The Vaccine Safety Handbook has circulated widely in the New York Hasidic community. Reporting on this phenomenon suggests that the booklet appears legitimate, but is filled with conspiracy theories and inaccurate data. The proliferation of such misguided information points to at least three underlying difficulties of challenging those who think that vaccines are unreasonably dangerous or cause autism. If you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so the underlying difficulties, the first is proving a double negative. Under the scientific method, it is very difficult to prove a negative. Um, the, um, this difficulty is amplified when dealing with the need to try to provide nuanced and contextualized engagement with scientific knowledge in the public domain. Um, the second is uh, the problem uh, or the challenge of probabilistic thinking. In fact, there are real negative side effects to vaccination, but the probabilities of them are occurring are small. And it is often the case that when it comes to vaccines, we see a dual challenge of probabilistic thinking. First, some people seem to overestimate the risk of an individual child having negative side effects. And second, underestimating the effect of foregoing vaccination on herd immunity. Though I did think um, the, the study that Elisa Sobo, Sobo showed us about how the people who are selectively vaccinating tend to have more accurate information than people who are not is, is quite interesting. Um, the third um, issue is the um, cultural commitments to a particular view of freedom. And this is also something that Elisa Sobo um, gestured to. So um, we do live in a society that has a very deep commitment to individual freedom. And um, ironically, the weakness in probabilistic thinking, I think, is, um, can also be reflected in the increasingly liberal exemptions granted by many state governments to vaccine requirements. And one way to understand this change of policy is to view it through the lens of a deep-seated cultural commitment in the United States to an ideology of individual choice where we equate choice with freedom. And it's a very distinctive um, dimension of the way in which Americans understand and experience freedom is this idea around choice. 
So in concluding, I also want to point to the fact that this all plays out in the context of a long history of powerful corporate interests working to sow confusion regarding the interpretation of scientific knowledge. So for example, the efforts of chemical and tobacco companies to hide or confuse scientific findings regarding their products. And also it's playing out in a history of um, medical experimentation, um, some of which has already been mentioned today, um, but medical experimentation and conflicts of interest um, that shape the way that people engage with medical and scientific knowledge in their everyday lives. So I'm gonna end there so we can move on to the next part. Thank you. And somebody has a cat. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Karen Sue. Our next presenter and our final presenter of the webinar is bringing this um, back into our, the global focus because while we are dealing with our measles outbreak here in the U.S., this is happening and outbreaks are happening around the world. And so I'm happy to welcome Shelley Lees and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Good, yes. wonderful. Yep, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to present. Um, I found all of these, uh, all the presentations really fascinating. Um, and I think, yes, it's, it's important to make clear that I'm, I'm taking this, um, um, the anthropological lens to a more global perspective and looking at emergent disease outbreaks. Um, but I think there are a number of, of issues that resonate with what is happening with the measles outbreaks. Uh, so the next slide. Um, so um, this was a really interesting opportunity. Our National Institute of Health Research um, organization in the UK put out a call for anthropological exploration of vaccine deployment during disease outbreaks. and. I think um, this is a response to uh, the West African Ebola outbreak where we are seeing many more calls for anthropological led inquiries into epidemic response, uh, but also to biomedical interventions for biomedical response. Um, so we were successful in um, um, receiving this grant and next slide. Um, and what's really important, I think, about this grant is that we've been managed, we've been able to gather together um, a number of anthropologists and social scientists to lead on this research. Um, and whereas um, I have been previously working on the anthropology of vaccine development, so a lot of my work has been around Ebola vaccine development in Sierra Leone, and now we'll be involved in work around vaccine development in DRC. Um, most of those studies are led by uh, uh, clinical scientists and epidemiologists. So um, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to see where anthropology can really contribute to our understanding of uh, vaccine acceptability or vaccine hesitancy or confidence or whatever we might want to call that. Um, so what I'm going to present here really is the plans for our research. Sadly, we don't have any results yet, but um, I wanted to present to you the ways in which we're going to inquire into this as anthropologists. So next slide. Um, so I think many of you um, who are listening are highly aware about anthropological um, criticisms of the response to the West African Ebola outbreak. Um, and there has been a longer historical critique of humanitarian response to disease outbreaks. And most of the critique focuses on arguments that there is an inadequate consideration of social, cultural, political, and religious factors in humanitarian response, responses. And this has, as we have seen in West Africa and we are seeing in um, Congo at the moment, that um, this has huge consequences for the effectiveness and community acceptability of the response activities. Uh, for particularly, and I think the real interest in uh, religious factors around the, uh, the, the discussions around the measles outbreak, 
um, is that there was a particular concern about um, the lack of understanding by response workers on local funeral practices and this lack of understanding built barriers between uh, response workers and local communities and fueled fears and mistrust and hampered dialogue and uh, compromise on risk reduction efforts. Um, alongside this critique from the anthropological, um, from anthropologists, then there's been some growing ev evidence um, on community and participant views on vaccine development. Um, so as I said, I've been working with other colleagues um, on um, anthropological perspectives on vaccine uh, development in, in Sierra Leone. And um, one of the uh, number of issues have arisen from that, particularly issues of power, fairness and trust um, and concerns um, which may look very localised but are very strongly linked to political um, and historical uh, con the political and historical context of Sierra Leone. Um, however, what we and others have found that whilst vaccine de development, particularly for, um, in Sierra Leone for the West African Ebola ep epidemic, was set up an environment that was imbued with fears, rumours and mistrust. Participants in the trials um, were mainly motivated to participate in the trials um, on, uh, on ideas of altru altruism, sacrifice, curiosity and hope about the vaccine. And this is something that's interesting whilst uh, we understand notions of mistrust that, that, that in other ways people, participants and um, are willing to um, become part of uh, vaccine trials because they want to um, to provide um, um, an op to support the development of vaccine that may protect not only themselves but um, others in their country and their context. Um, there's, as we know, there's been a large number of studies on vaccine acceptability um, in resource poor uh, contexts. Um, However, where vaccine unacceptability has been attribu attributed to problems of information and poor understanding of risk, um, others have, uh, social scientists and anthropologists have found that vaccination perceptions are complex and multifaceted with historical, cultural and political influences. Um, and such research has identified issues of trust and legitimacy and how acceptance of vaccination reflects social relationship, culture and values. Um, and so what we see here is that there's a more nuanced understanding of acceptability of vaccines um, that can relate to issues of confidence or hesitancy. Um, Others, other work has, has explored community knowledge of vaccines at the interface between animal and human health from the perspective of trust and social relationships. And more recently, we've seen with Zika, issues of trust have been further explored in relation to Zika and linked these to concerns and rumours about MMR vaccines, which has a relation to measles vaccination. So to date, whilst these, these uh, insights are helpful to understand potential issues for vaccine deployment and administration during an outbreak, there are gaps in evidence. And I think this is particularly related to acquiring evidence in real time. Now, the call for this, uh, for this grant was to answer one question about vaccine deployment. But as anthropologists, we are very much uh, driven by our research is very contextual, very localised, uh, whilst at the same very very much situated in political and historical contexts. Um, and so we um, decided that what would be important was to take a multifaceted approach to our research. Um, and so we aim to explore political and economic factors that determine whether vaccines can be deployed effectively. We aim to understand health system perspectives, which are closely tied to cultural policy and historical developments in provision 
and how provision is organized, um, as well as local systems to identify community perceptions surrounding vaccine use. And finally, given that many um, emergent diseases are zoonotic, we aim, to under, we aim to understand community experiences of vaccination in both human and animal health. Uh, next slide. Um, so essentially, I've outlined here that the aim of the study is to understand what are the complex web of factors determining the acceptability of vaccine deployment during outbreaks. And we have three main objectives, which, as I've described above, to explore political, economic and health system factors, to explore local and community knowledge that impact on vaccine deployment. Um, and then ultimately to develop and adapt rapid tools, uh, tools to explore these dimensions in the event of vaccine deployment. And as I will describe later, as the, this study started, the, for the Equator Ebola outbreak started in, um, in, the, in, in the Equator outbreak in DRC. And so we were, we were able to um, capture some of the experiences of the deployment of the Merck Ebola vaccine. Next slide. Hello. Next slide. Are we stop? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, this is just a, a, a picture um, that shows that we are taking a case study approach and we are be, have been quite pragmatic in working in countries where the key anthropologists have been working, so that our work is very much based on uh, in-depth in anthropological insights, um, addressing the questions that we have. So in Sierra Leone, this will uh, continue to draw on the work we've been doing there about vaccine development, um, but also um, situating it within the uh, Ebola outbreak, the 2014-2016 Ebola outbreak. Um, Sierra Leone also has Lassa fever outbreaks, so we're not just focusing on Ebola there. Um, in India, this is uh, very much more linked to healthcare systems um, and how these respond to vaccine controversy. And in Uganda, we're looking at local constructions of our knowledge with a focus on Rift Valley fever, which will, um, there's a new vaccination that will be deployed soon, which will be the same vaccination for animals as for humans. And our key anthropologists there will be working with local farmers to see how they understand the relation between animal and human vaccination. And in Brazil, we are. Um, in Brazil, we're looking at um, the experiences of post uh, Zika, which many of the rumours concerns about Zika were linked to vaccination itself, and to continue to understand people, any hesitancy and co confidence around vaccines more generally in Brazil. And then um, our, our most recent case study um, is that we um, are able now, we have um, deployed our anthropologist Lise, who has been interviewing people in DRC, uh, in Ecuador, about their experiences of the Ebola vaccine there. We're not able to get to North Kivu to directly interview people who are being vaccinated in the North Kivu, uh, epidemic. Um, however, um, we are um, strongly linked to social scientists in the field and we're collating as much information we can about those experiences. And there are some concerns um, about the ways in which the vaccine is being deployed in terms of communication and, and information around that. Um, but that's very, very early findings. And then we at the London School, which is linked to Public Health England, we have a public health rapid support team who respond to outbreaks and we have a social scientist on that team. And as we develop tools that can be implemented in any outbreaks, the rapid support team social science will take social scientists will take up that that those tools and hopefully apply them so that we can, rather than what we're unable to do in North Kiva at the moment, but we're able to understand in real time 
people's um, concerns, experiences, uh, mistrust or whatever about any vaccine deployment during an epidemic. Next slide. Shelley, we have about five minutes left just to okay. give you a heads up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so just very quickly, I'm sorry this is all very text heavy. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit more insight into each case study. So it'll literally take a minute each. So Sierra Leone, as I said, is very much focused on the political and economic factors that shape the feasibility of deploying vaccines in an emergency scenario. Scenario, so we're synthesizing existing knowledge on Sierra Leone's recent experience of Ebola vaccine trials. Um, and then we want to complement this knowledge on acceptability through primary research into the political and economic factors that influence the capability of a country like Sierra Leone to deploy vaccines. And then we'll do, we will work with key stakeholders to work through hypothetical scenarios to discuss future deployment plans. Next slide. In India, we want to investigate healthcare workers' responses to vaccine controversies using past public vaccine controversies in India as a basis for inquiry. Here we want to look at where the lines of responsibility are drawn between government and other public health actors, from pharma companies to NGOs, how ethical procedures are shared between stakeholders, and in which way controversies are communicated across organisations and how the poorest communities are affected by and, and, and are involved with contra controversies. Next slide. In Uganda, um, here we're look, exploring the construction of local knowledge around vaccines through the exploring, exploration of the use of human and veterinary pharmaceuticals. So to explore the potential for using local knowledge of subsistence and market-orientated small-scale farms in Uganda to improve collective understanding where a human animal boundary lies and in investigate a number of factors that may or may not influence local knowledge of vaccines. Next slide. Um, and in Brazil here, we're specifically exploring whether vaccine confidence and hesitant is different in the context or after disease outbreak with a focus on Zika. Next slide. And then Equator. We're conducting a retrospective analysis of vaccine consent practices, including communication approaches to deployment, explore the acceptability of the vaccine and its deployment method, uh, explore the successes and barriers to the delivery of the vaccine, and situate the emergency vaccination in the context of broader vaccine campaigns in the region. Next slide. And then the deployment case study will uh, deploy tools um, to um, to be able to in lifetime as I said um, assess the situation final slide um, and and so that I think what one of our first aims really to do is before we complete this case study research is to bring together preliminary insights into how vaccine knowledge, knowledge travels and transforms between pharmaceutical companies, humanitarian and research institutions, down to local health systems and communities. And our ultimate aim at this point is to contribute to a discussion of the ecosystem of practices that contribute to shaping vaccine science in public health emergencies for emergent and re-emergent diseases. That's, thank you.